After years of costly battles and atrocities, the Sino-Japanese War came to an end after the Chinese United Front lost the Battle of Chongqing and subsequently collapsed. In its place, the Japanese-controlled National Government of China sprung up. However, the decentralized and warlordesque nature of China continues. In the north, the Empire of Manchuria still exists, ruled by their Japanese puppet emperor. And in the south, the state of Guangdong is being ruled by four corporations. However, the most interesting warlord states lies all the way east, Yunnan province. Before the fall of the United Front, it was ruled by Long Yun. But knowing better than to continue the fight, he surrendered his position to his cousin Lu Han, who seeing no other choice, officially signed a ceasefire and surrendered to the national government. However, since the Japanese never truly invaded our region, we have been able to stay autonomous and Long Yun has even stayed somewhat in power as head of government. Still, it is mainly Lu Han who is deciding the future of our nation, and he has put all his efforts on modernizing our region no matter the cost. And the people are feeling the last part, especially as corruption is turning Han's focus away from the welfare of the average people. This has led to a bunch of different insurrection movements, everything from communists to Chiang Kai-shek loyalists. But currently the situation is still perfectly stable and as long as it remains, Lu Han will too. Right now our economy is relying mostly on foreign investments. For example, a few months ago a new resource deposit was found. Using the advantage of secret bidding, we could greatly expand the money we gained from it. And despite trying to nudge the bidding in favor of our landowners, the Japanese outbid them by a lot, greatly benefiting our economy. Still, a lot of money is being swept away through corruption as Lu Han is rewarding those who stay loyal, and those who don't face the law. But defeating the insurgencies is far harder than simply putting them before our courts. The main ones are the National Revolutionary Army who operate along the Burma Road, the Chinese Communist Party in the rural areas, the bandits in the southwestern mountains and lastly the biggest threat, the National Protection Army, who have successfully infiltrated the army and upper administrations without Han noticing much of it. So instead he focused firstly on the CCP, however their troops are battle hardened and receiving support from the Viet Minh rebellion in our south. Most of Han's actions weren't that effective, still some success was found by improving connections with the rural communities to get them away from the CCP. But then the government turned towards the NRA along the Burma road who have grown increasingly powerful. To try and fight them and take back the road, Han sent over an increasing amount of soldiers as well as tried to get the help of the Burmese government. Meanwhile, efforts had been started against the bandits in the southwest as well. The local militias and garrisons tried their best to root them out, but even with the loosened regulations, we are unsure what effects it gave. Lastly, Lu Han had tried to attack the National Protection Army, who seeks to liberate China and get revenge on the Japanese, an ideal which resonates with most of our generals in our army. Even Long Yun is favoring them. So it's mostly everyone except Lu Han, who seeks to continue the collaboration with Japan in order to modernize the state. And while Han did know somewhat about these inside rebels and did purge some of them, he also kept some at their positions, mainly the two generals, Zheng Zhensen and An Enpu, to try and infiltrate the NPA itself. But that was mostly it. Due to the decentralized and vast nature of our country, we are unsure if the government's efforts have actually been effective or if it has been infiltrated so much that Lu Han is sitting on borrowed time. So all he can do now is to simply close his eyes and hope that everything was enough, and then continue with other issues, mainly the modernization efforts, but there is also one more thing, Guingzhou. It is another warlord state in our east that just like us has been able to keep its distance away from the Japanese and the central government in Nanjing. But they aren't without an overlord as we have taken that role. And right now with an economic crash in Japan we have the perfect opportunity to try and unite with them without the central government or the Japanese complaining. 
The only thing standing in our way is their leader, Hei Ying Ching, who has tried his best to keep us away. And so we are faced with two choices. Either we get rid of him a fast and painless process, but one that could cause problems in the future. Or we look into a more peaceful and civilized process to work together towards a unification and not against each other. After careful consideration, Han decided to take the peaceful option, since creating another enemy could be disastrous. And so the first steps towards reunification were taken with the arrangement of a conference which would be hosted in a small town between our two states. Naturally, in order to gain an advantage in it, plenty of backhand deals took place. After all representatives and delegates from both our states arrived, the conference and debates could start. They were mostly about if a centralized or decentralized unification should take place. Regarding the economy, the centralized approach was chosen, since without a united economy would our two states truly be united. But regarding the legal codes, it is harder. On one hand, keeping them different would create a lot of friction. But on the other, if you unite the laws, the people of Guizhou, who are less enthusiastic about unification, could be slightly scared away. Still, Han decided to pursue full integration and unify their legal codes. Finally, the future of Hei Ying-Ching had to be decided. While some wanted him to be completely exiled, it was decided that he would be allowed to settle down in the countryside and at least stay somewhat in power as a governor or advisor. Now the conference came to an end as everything had been agreed upon. A grand celebration was held announcing the news of unification, and those who supported Han in his endeavors will of course be greatly rewarded. There was a minor, incredibly stupid and unsuccessful coup attempt to try and stop the unification in the last seconds. But other than that, the unification was successful and Han's hopes have become a reality. The map has been redrawn and he can continue with his modernization efforts. And just like always, its bread and butter is foreign investments from the sphere, which also includes bringing in talents from all over to help our factories and administrators. But with our unification with Guizhou, other doors have also opened themselves, mostly that of a bunch of new land which we can redistribute to suit Lu Han and our state. But now the true work begins, because to truly modernize we can't rely on foreign investments or land expansion. And we are more than prepared to do so, as our economy has steadily grown and due to years of government surplus our debt to GDP is only 6.5%. The general plan consists of two elements. The first is to play on our strengths. That we are one of the most resource rich states in the whole of the co-prosperity sphere and that our population is one of the most hard working even though they might not like it, it gives us a big advantage compared to our neighbors. But all this can be improved further. And the other is to improve those areas where we are the weakest. Mostly regarding infrastructure, corruption and the insurrections. But most of Lu Han's efforts started at the first part, the easier of the two. And with the unification with Guizhou, the investments have continued to surge, making all our regions richer. But mostly the southwest, where the unification opened up for a more direct trade link to the outside world. These investments have allowed us to improve the industrial base that we have in our country, massively expanding several factories and opening new ones as well. But to truly compete with everyone else, Lu Han has decided to multiply his so-called enhanced employment worker techniques. Yes, this might be slavery and yes, almost everyone is against it, but Lu Han is confident that it is the best way to modernize and enrich Chinan. Meanwhile, extensive work has started to survey the land for more resources. And as quickly as they were found, new mines were opened. Using equipment imported from our Japanese allies and investors, the effectiveness of them all also skyrocketed. And so continued the cycle. We would expand our surveying, turning over every single stone, and then the extraction process would begin. After this, Han turned towards our agriculture. 
The hardened worker laws had also been implemented here and our economic growth has already seen its benefits. Modernizing our farming techniques also greatly helped, allowing our farmers to work harder and more efficiently. So after all this our economy has truly started to grow and it has also become far more centralized as the Office of Economic Development was created which will continue Luhan's efforts at surveying and keeping the workers at maximum efficiency. This means he could turn towards the second part of the modernization plan to shore up our weaknesses. For quite a while the landlords had started to grow discontent with our government as according to them their privileges are being overlooked. To show their discontent they have already started forming societies to organize themselves and criticize Han. And this is a huge problem since the government needs to be friends with them, especially their money. So their societies were gathered into a congress of friendly societies to serve as an advisory and lobbying board for the landlords. It was an immediate success and despite worrying reports about injustice and crime committed by them it is Han's best interest to sweep them under the rug and look the other way. With plenty of great ideas from the society as well the money they and our government would make continued to increase. Sure with the landlords growing stronger corruption is going up as well but this isn't something bad for our government as it greatly benefits them. Meanwhile Lu Han had started drawing closer to the central government in Nanjing exploiting old connections and making new friends which allowed us to greatly strengthen our economic ties with them. Something which will allow our resources to more easily flow all across the sphere and grant us a heftier cut of the profits. Then came the last part of the plan. It has many similarities with our exploitation of our lands but mostly focusing on infrastructure since without it we wouldn't be able to exploit anything. And so several large scale construction projects were started in order to improve this issue. After some months Han could look at Xinan and see how it had progressed. Our GDP is growing almost 9% each year and GDP per capita reached over $100. The fruits of our labor also continue to fall into our mouths. Our industrial base can no longer be called incompetent. For the first time in year poverty is starting to decrease and with the help of the landlords the government's administrative powers have improved substantially. So now that everything is on course to greatness Han has decided to take a well deserved rest and fly to western Yunnan. Leaving his cousin Long Yun to take care of the government for a few days. But in the background for all this time during which Lu Han modernized our country the insurrections have been growing stronger and planned for a return. While at first only An Enpu and Zheng Zhengsheng cooperated with the NPA soon enough as Han's policies increasingly repressed our population more and more generals and ministers joined them. In addition all the different insurrection forces would increasingly begin to cooperate. The NPA started funding the NRA in Burma increasing their power and influence in the region. Even the CCP remnants who so far only had cooperated with their allies in Vietnam decided to try to as well and reform the united front to combat first Lu Han but then the much mightier enemy of Japan. This all culminated in one man joining the NPA none other than Long Yun the cousin of Lu Han. So once Han returned from his vacation he didn't return to any hugs or greetings but to the cold pitch black barrels of the rifle. And so Long Yun and the united front of all insurrection movements have taken over and the plan isn't to stay like things are. We will liberate China for the first time in more than 150 years. It's time for Japanese imperialism to end and for the rising sun to set down. But to win this struggle will be incredibly difficult and we must prepare before we can even begin. The NPA have already cut all connections with the sphere and preparations for war are already being implemented. The first step is our industry and here the economy has been closed with huge centralization efforts taking place. They then quickly began efforts to get women to start work in our factories and field. And it also started seizing plenty of assets from landlords in order to reduce waste to zero. A mad production frenzy has also started in our military factories to produce as much weapons needed for the liberation as possible. It has been further exacerbated with almost our whole economy turning towards the war efforts. But weapons mean nothing if our soldiers don't have honor and are willing to fight for the greater cause. Fortunately our population is filled with honor and almost every man is willing to be a soldier and stand up and fight. 
and despite the lack of experienced officers, our new and zealous ones largely make up for it as they are more than ready to sacrifice everything for China. Meanwhile, a battle for Chongqing has started, which was only able to start since the national government control in the area has been weak, to say the least. Therefore, by infiltrating the area, sending in guns and expanding our influence, we would soon be able to stage an uprising and take over Chengdu, Chongqing and even Dashian. In response, an ultimatum arrived from Nanjing, one which quickly was thrown in the trash, and so the second expedition began. China will be liberated or crushed forever, there is nothing in between. Due to our extensive preparations and all insurrection forces joining our army, its size is similar to the Nanjing government. And since the Japanese are occupied with economic issues, we are only expecting small volunteer forces at first, because officially they haven't joined the war and neither has anyone else. While we of course have to care about the battlefield, there are two more things that are important for our success our legitimacy and our war momentum. If our momentum slows down and halts, we risk to lose any chances to win as the bigger economies and industries of our enemies would rapidly outproduce us. But if it gains speed and our legitimacy as the true China grows, other warlords could be swayed to join the cause and take up arms against Nanjing and the Japanese. Now, before too many forces arrive to the front, let us start a war with victories. Our first objective is to reach the two neighboring cities of Shangde and Shangsa. At first, we saw major breakthroughs and entered our first city of Huaihua, but as we arrived to a major river, our offensive significantly slowed down. Fortunately, after a lot of back and forth, we had secured both sides of it and could continue to our target. On our way, Xiaoyang was captured and all the while in the north, we had also advanced toward Shangde. Uniting the two attacks, the battle for the two cities began and due to only a small amount of government troops defending it, we won both battles. This means we have taken over our first two states who will need to be cored. It is a tedious process where we must expand their administration and balance spending with military objectives. But this will all be taken care of in the background, so that we can concentrate on our military victories. Now that Hunan has mostly been captured, we will continue to Wuhan, and the quickest, easiest and the way with the most supply is through the south. In addition, we used the flat terrain to our advantage and advanced all the way to the next river. But while we tried to cross it there, we soon realized that it would be better to cross it in the east of Shangsha right into the important city of Yu Yang. Unfortunately, despite it being a surprise for the enemy generals, they could reinforce the city with troops from the north and the south, leading to a long and bloody battle. However, despite it looking bleak for our momentum, the city would be captured more than a month later, unlocking the road to Wuhan. And since our enemy had put all their forces in the battle, there was no defense in depth, allowing us to reach the outskirts of the city without any resistance. Sadly, it was defended, but instead of trying to painstakingly capture it, we decided to keep our momentum up and switch our offensive further east. Where after only a few days, Nanchang was captured, as we for the first time could cross a major river without much hardship. While the city entered a contested state between us and government forces, we staged our first encirclement operation, which was a great success, encircling five divisions and allowing us to capture Yi'an as well. After this majestic victory, our momentum is at an all-time high, together with our legitimacy and morale, and is enough to invite two warlords into the war, the NRA 24th Army, which has been a hotbed for Japanese resistance, and Guangxi Province. While the leader, just like Lu Han, was forced to sign peace with the Japanese, he has always dreamed of Chinese liberation, and now his time has come. Both of them gladly join the fight, which means that together with both Shangsa and Shangde being cored, we have more troops than the government. So let us continue and keep the momentum up. And if we do, we can soon invite Jin Chan to the United Front.
After absolutely crushing the government forces, we arrived to Nanjing and the national government surrendered. However, the Japanese were quick to establish the North China Political Council with most traitors who didn't defect to our side. Thus, we still have a long road ahead of us, because liberation can only be achieved if total liberation is. And since Guangdong, Beijing and Manchuria are all left to liberate, this means the actual war against the Japanese imperialists is here. They've already started preparing, sending troops to our borders and helping the North China Council to raise a few more troops. But we too have prepared with the little time we have. Our main forces are ready to cross the Yangtze River right as the orders arrive. And we have also reinforced the front with Guangdong where we might be able to stage a few initial offensives since the Japanese army hasn't fully mobilized yet. In the northwest, however, we have had to dug in around Xi'an since defending all of Shangxi is not a possibility. But the Japanese allies aren't without a threat in this region, as both the NRA 40th Army Group and the KMT forces in Xinjiang have sided with us. And so, with increased confidence, Long Yun declared that the occupation of China would come to an immediate end and launched all offensives. In the northern front, where there weren't many co-prosperity divisions, we simply started marching north. But in the south, where there were Japanese and Guangdong troops, including tanks, Long Yun took control himself. In the east of the region, there weren't any defenses, which we utilized to advance towards Hong Kong. Because their troops are stronger than ours, especially their tanks, the only advantage we have is our numbers. Therefore, we started an attack in the west as well, which would encircle Fang Cheng. A few days into the war, we arrived to the first of their three major big cities, Hong Kong. About at the same time, we encircled one tank division, which without supplies could be destroyed. After many more minor battles and one encircled tanks, Koshu or Guangzhou was surrounded, and so it fell quickly after. Still, despite their capital falling, they would continue to fight until we, by attacking their weaker flanks and not their tanks, could force them into Mao Ming. As the city didn't have any port infrastructure, their troops couldn't be evacuated and we could proclaim all of Guangdong liberated. During this offensive, we had also successfully crossed the Yellow River in the north and reached only 250 kilometers from Beijing. But before we launched the offensive to the northern capital, we first advanced into the Shandong Peninsula. After many battles and despite plenty of Japanese troops guarding Qingdao, both the city and Wei Highway were captured. During the campaign we received pressing military intelligence from the OFN, the Japanese are preparing naval invasions. While we do have some port garrisons, they aren't enough, so we deployed a bunch of our reserve forces to reinforce every single port town. Back to the north, we are ready to go for Beijing, especially since our allies in the west have put extra pressures on the occupiers already. But right as we wanted, the naval invasions hit. And they actually landed in one port. Fortunately, our most elite forces arrived right in time to contain them to only that port, which allowed us to gather our forces and crush the invaders in one single battle. A second invasion followed, which ended just like the first, and now finally we could start the attacks towards Beijing. Due to the extremely low force concentration of our enemies, we broke through immediately and with no defense in depth we had soon arrived to the northern capital. And then the North China Political Council capitulated. A day later we received an offer from the Japanese. It was a peace proposal where we would be allowed to keep all our current territories, but had to recognize Manchuria and Mongolia as non-Chinese territories. Of course this outlandish proposal was rejected and we advanced into Manchuria with full speed ahead. Since the Japanese army had already been absolutely ridiculed after the two failed naval invasions and with public sentiment in the country shifting, we didn't find many Japanese forces helping their allies to fight. And thus all major cities were captured, even the city that was previously called Vladivostok. However, we made sure not to cross into Korea, since we can't forget that the Japanese do have nuclear weapons. After the collapse of Manchuria, Mongolia was the last nation to resist, and we can easily say that this was a simple battle. After this, a second Japanese proposal arrived, and this one we agreed with, and so the Great Asian War is over, with a massive Chinese victory. All of China is liberated, as even the islands of Taiwan and Kuye have been promised to us. However, due to our lacking naval power, we will probably never get them. 
Still, this is nothing else than a victory. A few days after peace had been established, our great leader Long Yun, which had made all this possible, died. After years of war, death had finally catched up to him. Following the news of his death, the Republic began its first legislative assembly, and after hours of debate, a consensus had been reached on who should be our president. Sun Fu, the son of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Fortunately, he would accept the position and hastily return from his exile in America. A few days later, the Republic of China was declared. The work ahead of us is immense, our economy has been severely hurt after this war and peace is still fragile. But China is liberated and that is all that counts. No longer are we divided and subjugated, but for the first time in decades our country is united and free.